Welcome back to Flop Culture. This is the podcast all about your favourite flops. My name's Fanula. I hope you're well. I was off last week. I'm back. I'm raring to go. Some housekeeping up the top. Don't skip this because we've got some very cool events coming up. Beyond the Pale, it's this weekend. Flop Culture will be at the Beyond the Plate stage, June 22nd, which is the Saturday, the Saturday of Beyond the Pale. And we're going to be playing Bop or Flop with Irish food trends, food fads. We've got a very funny guest. So come see us. It's 3 p.m. at the Beyond the Plate stage at Beyond the Pale on Saturday, 3 p.m. Did I say that enough times? It's going to be really good. I can't wait. And save the date, August 14th at the Lighthouse Cinema. We're going to be hosting a very special screening of 10 Things I Hate About You. Bop culture, myself and Own Keen. It's as part of their 1999 season. I'll have more details on that very, very soon. But right now, save the date. Come join us. It's going to be a laugh. What an incredible film. I'm really excited. What a, what a busy week to get me back into the world of flops, eh? Let's get into it. KP6 is coming. Katy Perry has announced her first new music, I think, in four years. Her last album was Smile, which was 2020, as far as I'm aware. New song, Woman's World, it's coming July 11th. This has all been very heavily kind of hinted at on social media. She's obviously been very busy with the Vegas residency, which just wrapped up, and she just finished up her time on American Idol. At the end of her Vegas residency, there was a big tease about you know, seeing her next year because the residency ended in 2023. We're obviously in 2024 now. But even her kind of Instagram aesthetic had changed like a lot. And you could see that it seemed like she was kind of moving towards something like very much kind of aiming for like a Charlie XCX kind of dirty club rat girl vibe. That's what the Instagram was giving me and again as I said lots of rumors online then there was reports of private listening sessions for this new music and now it's here well we don't have the song yet but we have a snippet and we have confirmation that it's coming July 11th and we have a cover art in which she's wearing the tiniest bra and the largest boots I've ever seen and you know what the snippet does not sound that good (laughs) which is disappointing. It's like, there's there's a real want for this type of music and there's been lots of jokes among pop lovers, like the queer community, Kaylee Cats, that, you know, people were desperate for this. Like, do you see a response to like how much, how well Sabrina Carpenter is doing? Like that want for like real maximalist pop back. And Katy Perry did that in spades. She wasn't always successful, but when she was successful, like it really hit and it's interesting from her perspective because she's coming out of this flap era which we will be doing we will be doing an episode on that in advance of the music new music don't you worry I know it so highly requested now is the time I understand but she's coming out of this flap era so then you have the like the stakes are kind of higher than ever in in kind of in some ways she has nothing to lose and kind of everything to lose you know what I mean because it was grand when you were like Dicking away on Telly Junior Small Bits. She has her shoe brand. I don't know. Is anyone buying those shoes? I don't know. But it's like, you you have all the support behind you. What do you have to lose? Well, you could potentially lose that support by collaborating with someone who has previously been accused of sexual assault, Dr. Luke. Because that was another rumour around this rollout that... She was back with Dr. Luke. Obviously, they collaborated together very frequently in the early days of their career. Like, he is kind of credited fairly, maybe unfairly, with how successful Katie went on to be. So you have all these rumours then about KP6 and what's next and the aesthetics and what she's going to be doing and what she's kind of said herself. And then you have this song and we finally get confirmation about it. And when you look at the writing and production credits, he is on both. And that's... Very disappointing, needless to say. I know for some people, they're kind of able to separate themselves. Like, I know there's still people who listen to Kim Petras, who has continued to collaborate with him despite being called out on it, I suppose. Kesha maybe seemingly responded, Kesha being the one who made the initial allegations against Dr. Luke. Kesha came out and tweeted, lol, just kind of unprompted, seemingly connected to this news. I don't know. Obviously cannot confirm. I don't know, man. If you wanted to do something like really cool and a genuine, like really authentic rebrand, 
like Katie could go for like weird pop girl vibes. Katie could go and work with the people who've been working with Charlie or more like di- like different producers. You know what I mean? Get, I don't know, Dev Hines. Get like, call AG Cook. What if you just called AG Cook up? I don't know. Like you can't be that limited in your resources that it's like, okay, I'm, I just need to get back with this man who, I mean, I don't know. All the lawsuits stalled. The defamation suit against Kesha was dismissed. I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of just very disappointing as someone who really loves pop music and did really love that era of Katy Perry and Teenage Dream. This just actually doesn't, when you dig into it, it actually just doesn't feel in any way exciting anymore. And it could have been exciting, but the, the again, she's in a difficult position of being desperate for this to hit and desperate for this to be successful in a critical and commercial way. What do you do? You go back to the one person you know and the person you had success with. But I don't know how you do that without realising that the lands the landscape is just so different now for that person. I don't know. I don't know. I'll just, I'll stick to my teenage dream and not this fucking millennial nightmare that is women's, women's world. It's very fake empowerment. May, uh, look, we'll give it a listen when it comes out, but I'm not amused so far, girls. We've got our first teaser trailer for Smile 2 this week. I completely forgot this um, sequel was coming out. And I remember when the sequel was announced, I was a bit like, mm, maybe not. So this is a 2022 horror film, very fresh, very original, very scary, fundamentally. Um, but it kind of runs its own story. Like it's focused on essentially like pretty much one character story. So you're kind of wondering how do you kind of build on that without it being like ridiculous. So from what I can tell, this actually isn't going to be like a direct sequel in terms of that story. It This Smile 2 film is actually following an international pop star whose major tour is interrupted by the smirking faces she can't stop seeing. So girls, we love a fake pop star film, unless it's the idol, obviously. Uh, it's Naomi Scott is playing the pop star called Sky Riley. I'm going to leave a little clip here if you want to listen to it. Something really crazy is happening to me. I keep seeing this face everywhere. You witnessed a death. Now it's latched onto you. Stop smiling at me! So this is coming October 18th, 2024. I'm excited. I'm very excited. Finally, leading nicely into this week's flop, Nick Jonas and Adrian Warren are teaming up for the first ever Broadway production of Jason Robert Brown's The Last Five Years. This is a musical that looks at the kind of beginning and dissolution of a romantic relationship. It was first produced at Chicago's Northlight Theatre in 2001. Very exciting. I'm, I'm not hugely familiar with the musical, but I have friends who are. They were maybe slightly dubious around Nick's casting because the character that Nick plays in this film is a bit of a just kind of ends up being a bit of an asshole but you know Nick has his acting chops and Nick has done musical theatre before I think this is where he wants to be I think he's maybe kind of I think the Jonas Brothers stuff is kind of maybe done in his mind because I've talked about this frequently on here and on bandwagons that tour that they're on that they're supposed to be playing Dublin that got rescheduled or whatever I don't think that's going to happen respectfully because the dates were postponed because Nick went away and started shooting a film with Paul Rudd here like a romantic kind of musical comedy from what I could tell and you have this news and obviously this show doesn't start until next spring but I just feel like they're kind of done maybe maybe not done like forever forever but definitely this iteration the second wind they're over it and the solo music maybe he feels like he's taken that as far as he can I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I'm really, really intrigued to hear how he gets on with this adaptation. Future Tony Award winner? Could Nick Jonas EGOT? What do we think? Anyway, on the topic of the Jonases, let's get into this week's flop. Kevin, Joe and Nick Jonas enjoyed huge success as the Jonas Brothers in the noughties as a Disney commodity and with their own musical endeavours. They even managed a successful second act in the 2010s, notoriously difficult for a boy turned man band. But before this, the three lads had their own goals at solo stardom. Joe released his debut solo album, Fast Life, in 2011. The album showcased a more mature R&B-influenced sound, but it didn't achieve the commercial success many anticipated. Despite this, 
Joe did not give up on music. In 2015, he formed the band DNCE and their debut single, Cake by the Ocean, became an international hit. DNCE's self-titled album released in 2016 was generally well-received. Nick's solo journey began even before the Jonas Brothers disbanded. In 2010, he released an album with his side project, Nick Jonas and the Administration. However, it was his solo work post-Jonas Brothers that truly made waves. In 2014, he released his self-titled album featuring the hit singles Jealous and Chains. The album showcased a more mature R&B and pop and fuse sound, earning critical acclaim and commercial success. He followed up with the album Last Year Was Complicated in 2016, further cementing his status as a solo artist. Nick Jonas's final solo album as of recording was Space Man, released in 2021. Nick has also been pursuing acting in series like Kingdom, Scream Queens, and appearing in movies like Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, and its sequel. Kevin has yet to attempt a solo music career, but that does not mean he's been resting on his laurels. After the Jonas Brothers initially disbanded in 2013, Kevin turned his attention to business ventures and reality TV. He founded a real estate development company called Jonas Werner, and later co-founded The Blue Market, which focuses on influencer marketing. In 2012, Kevin and his wife Danielle starred in their own reality TV show, Married to Jonas, which gave fans an inside look into their lives. Kevin also appeared on Celebrity Apprentice in 2014. He now hosts the reality series Claim to Fame alongside younger brother Franklin Jonas. So, as Joe seemingly gears up to release new solo music and Nick heads for Broadway, it begs the question, who is the floppiest and boppiest Jonas brother? Joining me to discuss is presenter and producer Quiva Nicole. Enjoy. Quiva Nicole Falcha got flop culture. Can I say talk to you? Tommy, good morning. It's your Marisha Tossa. I am great. I'm Tom Arbish. Tom Arbish to talk Jonas Brothers solo careers because it's all <laughs> I ever, ever want to talk about. But I'm, before we kind of look to the present and where they're at now, I want to go back. I want to look a little bit back. Were you like a hardcore Jonas Brothers fan? What are the jo- what are Jonas Brothers fans called? Joe Brohos? No, oh, do we know? Well, I mean, I just called myself Quiva Jonas, obviously, for Nola. <laughs> uh, I'm not really sure what we were supposed to be called. Um, no, actually, my handles at the time were Quiva Jonas. And then I think I changed to Quiva 2JB because there were two JBs in my life. It was Jonas Brothers and Justin Bieber. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah, and so, you had to, you know, you had I had to, to, to represent. But you luckily, just split custody JB. between the JBs. I yeah. love that. And it was really handy for the tattoo as well. Just JB. Oh, of course. Of yeah. <laughs> love that. Love that. Um, but no, I, I was I was a big, big fan. But I think kind of in the classic of like the kind of 2009, kind of 2008, I suppose, in Ireland, we were a little bit behind. You know, now I feel like we get everything at the same time as America. But I just mm. felt like at the time... It was kind of it kind of took a little li- bit longer, if you pardon the yeah. pun, oh, um, to come to Ireland. So I remember sitting at the back of a uh, geography class with my friend Emer, and she had Disney Channel and I didn't. So mm. he taught me the words of SOS at the back of our geography class when obviously we were supposed to be listening to our teacher. Um, and that kind of I don't know I, I instantly thought okay I'm interested in this. Went home, went onto YouTube, and fell in love head over heels with Nick Jonas in particular, and became obsessed like. Bought the albums, watched Camp Rock obsessively and was really into Jonas Brothers and the Disney Channel and everyone involved in the Disney Channel at the time, even though, as I say, I didn't have Disney Channel. I used to watch like Hannah Montana, Jonas LA, Wizard Baby Place in like three parts on YouTube and really was, you know, dedicated to the cause of, of getting this content and consuming this content because my parents wouldn't buy Disney Channel. So I was I was obsessed. But obviously it wasn't that cool to be obsessed with the Jonas Brothers. Mm. Yeah, kind of regardless I just I just kept going I just thought they were brilliant I truly any bit of an interview or a meme or a wallpaper or a, anything I could get online and consume online I just I was obsessed I was truly obsessed with Jonas Brothers I followed kind of a similar path to you although I don't think I got into them as much as you because I also didn't have Disney Channel hello poverty um, and I was uh, getting all the content, like sec- like all the Camp Rock content, all of that kind of secondhand. But I do remember SOS was also kind of my entry point. I remember being like, mm, a little bit of a banger here, guys. What's this? <laughs> I love this. This is good. And I kind of okay. kept tabs here and there. I found it hysterical that they did a cover of Year 3000 as a, as a busted girl as well. 
Yeah, and which so many people in America didn't even realize obviously was a busted song. Like you, you kind of, it's obviously strange to us who grew up with busted McFly, like all of those bands that we knew busted three thousand to be their song. I really, I actually, when I discovered Jonas Brothers covered it, I wasn't that keen on even the thought of it because I just thought, no, this is busted song. So yeah, mm. but in America, they fully believe it's a Jonas Brothers song, which is bizarre. We have to do more with regards to education, <laughs> girls, to especially campaign. in the United States. Yeah, if anyone can help there, please um, get in touch. I remember, I've like really specific memories around because I, this was around the time when I was spending like so much time online and on the computer and YouTube was a big part of like my daily routine and yeah. checking in on all the music videos. And this was around the time as well they had released the Burning Up video. And I was like, oh, I like this song as well. But it was obviously like a little bit scandalous because you have Selena Gomez making a cameo and there were lots of rumours at the time about her dating. It was yeah. uh, Nick. Nick yep. and Joel, the dating history, there's a lot, it gets well, I mean, complicated if to you say the least. A, a star at the time, like a female star, like, you know, a Disney Channel star, you probably did have a rendezvous with the Jonas Brothers. <laughs> like for all of their chat of like purity rings and their their dad being um, a pastor in their like local church and everything, they were into women. Like they mm. had a lot of kind of high profile um, dating incidents, I would say, because if you think about like Selena Gomez and yet yeah, the absolute scandal of the burning up um, music video, but then also obviously Taylor Swift famously was Joe Jonas, Gigi Hadid, uh, Olivia Culp, but like there were so many beautiful women that were just kind of surrounding the Jonas Brothers and then the kind of the drama that ensued. So I lapped that up. I mean, when when Miley Cyrus and Nick Jonas sang together again on both of their albums after having broken up and gone through all that I was obsessed I thought well you know what this is a healthy relationship they were able to break up and they're able to sing together again they were like heroes in terms of like kind of love life and romance and everything else like they just I was obsessed with all the drama surrounding that and like you you know was online quite a lot anytime I could get the computer off my siblings but then also you know had a phone by that stage had like an iPod touch so I was bet into YouTube and bet into this thing called Cambio. I don't know if you remember it. But no, it like I a, don't. What's that? It's like an American site that was very much geared towards like Jonas Brothers, Miley Cyrus, Selena Gomez. And it was just basically about all the Disney Channel stars, but they had like okay. live streams. Um, they had, they made videos, interviewed them, you know, so anything I could get my hands on, I was, I was pretty hooked to be honest. Fair. Did you ever get to see them live? So... <laughs> I would say I don't hold on to grudges, but I will hold on to <laughs> for my mother. When I was in third year, yeah, in third year secondary school, the Jonas Brothers came to Ireland and I said to my mum, I want to go to Dublin. Now, obviously being from Donegal was quite a big deal to go down to Dublin, yeah. quite, yeah. you know, quite a trip. And I said, I want to go to the Jonas Brothers. And my mum said, is there going to be any adults going with you? And I said, no. And she said, well, then you're not going. So my friends, Bridget and Emer, got to buy tickets. They got to go. Was there a parent with them? Yes, there was in the end. So I sat and to say, Fanula, I actually wrote a song that night. Like I sat in my house and I cried. They rang me during a little bit longer. So no. I could hear, you know, Nick Jonas no. about his diabetes and his, you know, uh, as he as he played the piano and I bawled my eyes out. So to rectify that, aged, okay, if I'm now 29, I would say age 25. Okay. I went to Glasgow and I saw them. So on their like comeback tour a couple of years ago, af obviously after the split and everything else, they had a world tour. Um, they did come to Dublin, very hard to get tickets, but I went to Glasgow and Glasgow was kind of like a second home to me anyway. So I was delighted. So I finally got to see them, but like 10 years too late in a lot okay. of ways. Like if I had seen them when I was, you know, 15, I think, I mean, it, I'd say the obsession would have been quite, quite dangerous at that point, but yeah. I still hold on to that grudge. And I'd like to remind my mother of the time she stopped me from seeing the Jonas Brothers. But Honestly, fair, fair. No, That's I infuriating. Mean, it's infuriating. And especially when you think about like, okay, so what was my first concert after that then? Taylor Swift, actually. Taylor Swift was my first concert. So like... Hey, not bad. You know, not bad though. Not bad. Not, not bad. It was amazing. I was just on the verge, I feel like, of getting to go to concerts, but I just wasn't quite there. Mm. Um, so yes, but I, at least I made up for it. And I do have tickets to the tour this year um, for Belfast. I live in Belfast now. So they're come, they were supposed to be coming in June. They're now coming on a Monday in September, apparently. Mm. And, and I mean, the drama surrounding that is even a whole other topic, but, you know, I'm excited to see them because I'm excited to see kind of like an era's 
tour. You know, they're planning to tour all their albums. They've gone all around America and South America with it so far. And like that really excites me because I think that will really bring me back. But it is... I don't know. There's something a bit bittersweet about it at the moment, especially because Nick Jonas is wandering around Dublin and they can't come up to Belfast to do their tour dates in June. Yeah. 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 He's a he signed up to do this movie with Paul Rudd that I'm going to be honest, can, sounds kind of terrible, but like good for him. Happy for <laughs> him that he's working and busy. <laughs> but I have tickets for the Dublin show and as well was also like, the minute it was rescheduled, I was like, you kind of get the alarm bells ringing and you're like, yeah. mm, okay. And like, I really would like to see them especially as someone who gets entertained the soul like I, I'm liking the latter day Jonas Brothers stuff even in comparison to the earlier stuff but as someone who was it's funny that I never really got into the Jonas Brothers but to say I was bet into the Joe Jonas and Nick Jonas solo careers is like if I I think a lot of my mental health problems would be solved by hearing Nick Jonas do Jealous Live <laughs> if you did 30 seconds of it I actually did here in Glasgow. I have to say, Fanilla, it's it's a religious. Was it experience. amazing? But oh. see, that's funny that you were like so bet into their solo careers because I would say, as an OG Jonas Brothers fan, I wasn't that bet into their solo careers. Well, that's because- what I was going to ask. So, like, did you not? Did you because you know they have their success? There's an album in the middle. I think it's Lines, Vines, and Trying Times. That's yeah. They have Paranoid on it, and kind of doesn't do that well. I think people think it's kind of like too adult Rocky doesn't kind of hit the way the other albums do and then they're all kind of mapping out their own kind of pads at that point did you why didn't you follow them were you just kind of over it or what well I would say that I did follow them while they were still the Jonas Brothers so while they were still the Jonas Brothers and still you know Lions Men's Trying Times like that's kind of the time that say for example Nick launched in 2009 Nick Jonas and the Administration loved that album again not many people did I mean, okay people, like, should I go back and listen I oh. always took the piss out of it because it's very like and he acknowledges it it's such a rip of Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band and like it's oh, named like Jonas and the administration because he's quote unquote obsessed with the presidency which... no, he was obsessed with the presidency he was going to run for president I was going to somehow vote for him he was obsessed oh I would have as well perfect oh, he's got my God. vote that man be jealous he can do it everyone <laughs> Especially if that's his campaign song. He was obsessed with like the Eagles. He was obsessed with like all these bands that I was like, if my dad questioned my taste in music, I was like, no, but but dad, Nick Jonas loves the Eagles. Nick Jonas loves Bruce Springsteen. Come on. And he's like, like I used to like get my parents to play it in the car. They were absolutely deafened by it. They thought it was horrendous. I was obsessed with that album. It's I rock thought it was music, good. guys. I thought it's it was, rock music. Yeah, I thought it was it's so mature. I was like, listen to his sound. Now when I listen to it, obviously my taste in music has to some degree developed and you know I don't think it's the piece of perfection that I thought as a 15 year old but honestly I was fully obsessed with that Joe Jonas at the same time like I I I suppose I was biased because Nick Jonas was my favorite uh, like by a long long stretch when Joe Jonas ventured out on his own while also being in the Jonas Brothers um he put out this album Fast Life now Banger Quiva but like I'm sorry an actual album full of bangers and I won't have a bad a single bad word said about it so whatever you're you about to what? say you know what? carefully you know what okay bangers but like commercially what a flop it was oh, a flop like it, it was an absolute flop and like his whole like image around it I thought it was a flop like he was clearly trying to be someone he was not like mm. he was trying to disguise himself as this like you know kind of get into dance more dancey more commercial this kind of cool guy like he caught his hair I was like Joe this is not you. So, mm. but now, aside from that, when Fast Life came out, obviously I bought it. I actually have a signed copy. If I was in Donegal, I would have it. I'm not in Donegal right now, but I was sent a signed copy. Um, the, on BBC Radio 1, he held up a piece of paper that had my username on it. I don't know if you remember this, but BBC Radio 1 used to do this. When celebrities would come in, they would like print out 10 people's Instagram usernames and the celebrity would hold them up. He held up my username, which was... Oh my gosh. So like, you know, I, I claim to have not been bad into their solar careers, but at the same time as an OG was like very supportive of it. You were Just very to- supportive, but the music... Not Didn't Nick Jonas and the administration aside, you weren't into the Joe Jonas solo stuff, really. No, I really wasn't. Like, um, would listen to it, you know, to give him to give him a wee lesson because it wasn't <laughs> doing, <laughs> to be but, to be supportive. Tell him with the finances. No. Yeah, exactly. But I just I wasn't convinced. But I just think it's interesting that they were kind of like 
you know, dabbling in a solo career while claiming that it wasn't going to affect the Jonas Brothers. Like before Nick Jonas and the administration released an album, he wrote a letter to the fans and he said, you know, like, do not worry. This is just going to make us stronger as a band. This is, you know, this is not me leaving the band. And yes, it took a couple of years for them to actually announce their split. But like, there was definitely rumblings. But Mm. like, all you know, very understandable at the same time. I mean, they started in 2005. They had been on the road for a long time. They had done a lot of stuff. And clearly you know, even listening to Nick Jonas' administration versus Fast Life by Joe Jonas, like, what a difference. Um, And at the same time, Kevin Jonas was doing Married to Jonas. So he was doing his reality TV show, which I think got me through the leaving search, to be honest. I used to Honestly, like, a, like kind of a banger of rea- like a good, oh. a good fare from E considering some of the other shit they've put out in the past, you know? Literally. We all stand Daniel, that- Danielle Jonas, you know what I mean? Like, good oh, really? lady, big fan Again, of her. She gave us all hope. We too could go on holiday and meet a Jonas brother and they could fall in love with us. Like she gave me hope. I thought, you know what, if Danielle can do it. And isn't it funny, like the hangups from that time, like sometimes I go into my Instagram, I'm like, who the hell am I following? And I'm like, oh, it's Danielle Jonas's cousin who was once unmarried to Jonas, who wants me, you know, like all these kind of like hangups of like people you follow from back in the day. But I did, I really did enjoy Marta Jonas, Marta Jonas. So like all of this was happening, I feel like. So this was all kind of like rumbling and mm. presumably added to the fact that they were going to go, you know, they were on hiatus, but they came back. They had, you know, they were going to go on a, another world tour. They were going to release a new album, V or Five, however you want to say it. Um, but it just didn't happen. And it, it, the split happened, which was at the time heartbreaking. Now, we were in first year of college, so... I, I wouldn't say I was shouting about the fact that I was heartbroken about the Jonas Was Brothers it first stuff. year college they split? It feels well, like it, was, it feels like later and kind of earlier at the same time. It was 2013. So like yeah. that's when we college. I mean That's crazy. So I think yeah, but I think it proves your point that like they kind of were on hiatus, quote unquote, but they essentially weren't together for ages before they were definitively like, no, no, like yeah. we're not, we're not yeah, together. When, and as you said, yeah. I wonder, was it just a thing of Okay, we'll see how Joe gets on with Fast Life. That didn't go well. Yeah. All the rest of them are kind of doing their own thing. And then it was like, okay, we don't want to do this right now, but like we can't leave people hanging on. So we may just exactly. say it now. Exactly. And I think like, you know, when they released pom poms and things like that, like they hadn't released any music together since Lines, Binds, and Trying Times. So it had been a few years and mm. all of a sudden coming out with like these big kind of like, I don't know, like musical numbers that felt like more than like an actual structured, you know, kind of album plan. Like it was fun, but you didn't really know where they were going with it. And clearly either did they, they because they did split up then. And like, you know, obviously they've talked about it. They talked about it at the time, they've talked about it since, but like Nick Jonas definitely made the point that he felt they had come to kind of like a conclusion in terms of sound they weren't developing and mm. clearly from their solo projects, they were all looking to go different directions. So like a split kind of seemed inevitable, but it's like any of these, it's like, you know, with Zane leaving One Direction or like any of these like dramas or, or things that happen, like you kind of don't want to admit to yourself, but like the end is nigh at that point. Yeah. You know, we're all kind yeah. of trying different things. Yeah. And it is, I wonder if it was a thing of also just kind of waiting out the fan base for them to be like a little bit older and kind of for it to be that natural end as well someone should be in prison for pom-poms Jesus Christ I can't believe you just reminded me of that song it's horrific horrific it's and so again bad. probably didn't want to admit it at the time but now I can look back as an older woman and say that was horrendous now live it's good crack probably I, I wouldn't say they'd be playing it on this tour I don't know if they really want to even delve into the fact that they made an appearance and then disappeared but yeah. um no, awful song and clearly it was just like I don't know someone was looking for a chant for a football match, but yes. it was awful, awful. Yeah, it's very of the time. Is that mm-hmm. the album that has first time on it as well? No, or does that come later? That's a fucking crack no. of a song. Yeah, no, that, that comes, comes later, later, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they literally it, just released two singles and then went. Ah, okay, yes, yes, yes. And then and I think first time was on the. F- appearance. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because like when they were originally going around trying to get like signed, it was actually kind of Nick as a child who was being shopped around to labels. And then they kind of didn't want him on his own because Mm -hmm. pre 
Nick Jonas the administration he'd done like essentially an album as a child that is like respectfully dog shit because everything we do with children is <laughs> dog shit no offence Nick yeah. I do love Much you like our albums as children truly awful. yeah absolutely as someone who did previously write a song for a book she wrote about fairies because she was so convinced it was going to be made into a movie like I get it it's fine absolutely fine oh. we're not winning, we're not winning granny, Grammys we're, we're not e here no we're no. not bitter either no, no. Um, he did like they obviously recorded stuff with the two brothers then and they liked that and I think there was a bit of a deal with Columbia, that kind of fell through and then they ended up going to Hollywood Records. But it's just interesting then in the end that it was kind of Nick that had the most successful commercially and I suppose content yeah. wise, like the most successful solo career. Because like, look, we've been joking about Jealous, but even if you look at some of the other albums, even if, I don't know, I feel like Irish people might not be familiar with them, but like they charted extremely well in the States, sold extremely well. And like mm-hmm. critically, we're kind of like, Oh yeah, okay. No, this this is actually good. He like Nick Jonas is a pop star in his own right. Yeah, and I I mean I think that definitely was always going to be the case. You know, like as you say, like he was the kind of the star at the start, and like even his you know Broadway career and like appearances in Les Mis as a child and then as an adult, like he had more of a standing musically, I think, than any of the rest of them. Um, but definitely like his. When in 2014, he released Nick Jonas, the album. So, like, that's why we have Chains, Jealous, Levels. He then did another version. It was, like, Nick Jonas 2 um, with some extra songs. But again, I think it was just, like, these songs are great. They're doing well. Like, let's put them out again. Um, and his third album this last year was complicated. Um, they were all successes. So, like, by himself, after the split, like, he definitely had more commercial success I suppose, as an individual, maybe than even the Jonas Brothers had in that Jonas Brothers are highly successful and have a huge fan base and huge following, but commercially and like billboard wise, wouldn't, Mm. you know, have amazing numbers. But like he had three billboard 200 appearances Mm. as a solo artist. He had eight hot 100 appearances. Um, So he really, you know, and even like the, if you think about how much you know, the likes of BBC Radio 1 or like 2FM or, you know, these stations were playing Jealous and Chains and Levels was so much bigger than any Jonas Brothers song that they had previously played. Like it was, re- you really weren't hearing Jonas Brothers on the radio, whereas you were hearing Nick Jonas. Um, yeah. And, you know, I suppose, yeah, I think it was it was always going to be that way Um, in terms of, as you say, like how they started. But I do think he kind of like, he did in some way kind of cling on to that success he had as a solo artist I still think it's not as worldwide successful as the Jonas Brothers like I know definitely not this, you know later I still think solo wise they are not successful we've seen it since they've now come back together as the Jonas Brothers they ha- are having more success I would say than ever as the Jonas mm. Brothers so you know it's still interesting to to kind of to point that out but definitely Nick Jonas most successful by himself by a lot. Yeah. Last year was complicated, as you mentioned. Like, that went to number two on the Billboard yeah. 200, which is, like, kind of absolutely nuts. Like, really yeah. positive reviews for music critics. Stephen Thomas, Erlewine, claimed that the album feels mm-hmm. assured in a way its eponymous 2014 predecessor did not. The entirety of last year was complicated. Walks a fine line between immaculately produced pop confection and personal confession. It may not be heartbreaking, but it feels as if it comes from the heart. Like lots of really strong review. Keith Harris for Rolling Stones that Jonas is personal and versatile on the record while praising his supple falsetto for sounding wounded or seductive as required. Like oh. it's interesting where like obviously he did the rock I'm, I'm Bruce Springsteen, I'm whoever you want me to be, the first album. And then he kind of adopted what Joe tried to do on Fastlane, but kind of yeah. failed to do. Like, Joe really tried to position himself as, like, it's giving very Justin Timberlake future sex love sounds. You know what I mean? It's giving, yeah. I can do R&B, like, I'm, I'm hot, like, a cool, I can work with all these black artists and, like, do lots of, like, rap remixes. And at the time, it came off, like, Look, I still maintain the album's a banger, but I can understand people being like, this is really, this is really at odds with what we've seen you do. Whereas like Nick, I think, made the right call in waiting until they were done, biding his time, coming out as an adult, essentially, and an adult man and being like, I'm sexy. I have sex. I like women. Yes. We were like, what? I'm heartbroken about things. We were shocked. Oh, we were shocked. 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 But no, you're so right. And it probably is all about timing in that 
you know, Joe Jonas just got the timing wrong. Like that was what, like 2011. We were not ready for that side of a Jonas brother yet. It wasn't, mm. it was just, it was too early. Whereas Nick got it at the right time. It felt right in terms of like musically. It was much, much stronger. His voice, I think, is much stronger than Joe's as well. Yes, in yeah. Certain, you know, in kind of, I suppose, in certain situations as well. But yeah, it just felt much stronger and it felt more authentically that this, was something he wanted to do as a solo career instead of Joe being like, oh, I'll just do this little side thing because next doing a side thing, you know, it just felt much more authentic. Um, mm. But like, I will say even as a huge, like Nick Jonas Stan and, you know, Jonas Brothers Stan, I didn't follow it as closely as I'd followed. Now, obviously I was growing up so, you know, I was kind of getting into other music and everything else, but like he had other albums, like he had Spaceman into the 2021. I, I'm not, I think I've listened to it once. Like I really... I really wasn't keeping as close an eye on his later stuff, I think, then yeah. as a school artist. I think I felt like, okay, you know, Jealous Chains levels, like that's peak you by yourself. And I think like, kind of like, let's take that off the list. I really didn't keep as close an eye on it, on his solo career after that. I think I was just biding my time for one day, the Jonas Brothers were going to come back. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where maybe Spaceman kind of flopped slightly. So as you mentioned, it came out in 2021. So like, COVID time again. So COVID eats yeah. up everything. It felt like there was kind of loads of promo and no promo for this album. I remember I remember him doing Graham Norton to talk yeah. about the album and I think the title track and again, his wife, Priyanka Chopra is in that video. And I remember being like, okay, interesting. And I have listened to the album and again, I do like it, but this is also his first solo album since they got back, they got back together in 2019. Mm -hmm. And like that became such a moment like they had this unprecedented success with soccer and this real like actual appetite for kind of new music and a tour as opposed to like it just being a nostalgia thing that I think yeah. it kind of cannibalized any efforts he wanted to make at a, at a solo career. I don't know, because again, it did well critically, commercially, definitely not as successful as last year was complicated. Yeah. No, and which is, yeah, it, it is interesting how he kind of like, maintain that solo career or try to maintain that solo career when the Jonas Brothers back and as you say like the success of soccer was unprecedented like we all remember where we were when it came out maybe you don't but I do I was oh I do I do oh my god like it was the music video like I was deathly hungover I was lying on the couch I put on the music video and to say I played that song 700 times that day and like <laughs> went to a house party that night and made them play the song like I was truly obsessed and it's commercial you know and radio play and everything else success was just unbelievable but yeah the fact that he kind of thought oh yeah sure I'll still give this solo thing a go when we're having so much success as the Jonas Brothers was a bit odd you know and mm. I think I was definitely like okay the Jonas Brothers are back by this point I really don't feel the need to listen to a Nick Jonas album like as I say I definitely listened to it once but nothing none of it kind of stuck with me um but, you know, Happiness Begins had come out already in 2019. Like the, they had new material. And I think mm. for maybe like the OG fan, that was maybe enough to satisfy us, by us at that point. But interesting that he kind of wanted to give it another go. Yeah, I, it kind of gives like label obligation. Like I wonder had he signed for three, this is technically his fourth album, including Nick Jones, mm. The Administration, and act, will actually technically his fifth, including the one he did as a child, if we're going to be pedantic. <laughs> but like, I wonder, how, did he just have a three album deal? And Quite, was yeah. like, I have all this music. Because again, as much as I think it's good, it's all kind of in the same vein in terms of like pop dance, R&B. Like there's a song called Sexual on Sp uh, Spaceman that could be mm. on, that could have been on the self-titled album. You know what I mean? Like he's not necessarily advancing the artistry. So I'm wondering, was he just like, and oh yeah, I have... Yeah, I have to release another album. I have all of these songs worked on. Jonas Brothers is kind of kicking off in a way that maybe they did anticipate, maybe they didn't. I don't know. So he's like, okay, here we go. Here's the album. And, <laughs> and I went I, I like, okay, I, will you talk to Graham yeah. Norton about it? And he was like, yeah, absolutely, sure, whatever. Bye. Whatever I have to do. But yeah, because yeah, funny, like, you know, kind of the coverage of it, I do think I was a bit confused at the time because they were, you know, it was like he'd be posting about the Jonas Brothers and then he'd be posting about, you know, his solo stuff and kind of like that, trying to have that difference between them, I thought was quite interesting. And like, even like just from a social media point of view or like a PR point of view, it probably was, you're probably right, it probably was some kind of a deal because it did feel kind of confusing at the time. Um, and I don't know, like, is that going to continue? Like, are you know, either them going to release some kind of a solo album while they're still the Jonas Brothers. Who knows? Because to be honest, it's been such a roller coaster to this point. Who knows what is ahead for the Jonas mm. Brothers 
and where that particular train is going. Um, but yeah, it was an interesting decision and definitely an album that really went over my head, I have to say. Yeah. Even just to go back to Joe and to compare it, like we talk about Fast Life. So Fast Life came out the end of 2011 and this was another Hollywood Records label deal, which is who Jonas Brothers were signed to originally. It's like, I don't know if it's officially Disney affiliated, but it's essentially like all of the OG Disney people are at least initially signed to them and released through them. So released October 11th, 2011, debuted at number 15 on the Billboard 200 and like massively fell off the charts. I think by 2015, it had only sold 45,000 copies. It's obviously probably sold more since. It's me I mean, streaming is... Oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank God we did our bit. So that's fine. But like, that's to put it into perspective. Like, I, what was it about Nick that made him the favourite to you? Like, we've talked about timing, but I think it's... It's interesting because you were either a Joe girl or a Nick girl. Sorry, Kevin. I mean, I mean this so respectfully, but I mean, you know what I mean? He was a Kevin girl. <laughs> like it, but like between the two of them, it could like, depending on what day you ask people, it, it was like 51, yeah. 49% to the other person. You know what I mean? So why was it? We talked about timing. What were the other factors that made Nick the more followable artist, do you think, in comparison to Joe? Because Joe obviously goes on and does DNCE, that weird dance group that he has, yeah. that again... Enjoyed some kind of moderate success, but nothing to the level of what to what Nick was able to achieve. I know, because I think it's so interesting. I think it's quite hard to track because if you think about it, Joe Jonas is the star of Camp Rock. Like he should have been, you know, the kind of the standout star of the Jonas Brothers. And I know like myself and my friend Jenna, we were both obsessed with the Jonas Brothers, but mine was Nick and hers was Joe. Like, and she, you know, we very much kind of followed that along and remained loyal whereas as you say a lot of other fans might have like flip-flopped um throughout the years this sounds cynical okay but Nick Jonas had a very human story in that he was always talking about his diabetes and like I I shouldn't laugh but like it, it it was true you know it was a bit ridiculous at points um but he had this like I don't know, deeper connection almost with his fans and with his listeners and with his followers that he was really like sharing a huge part of him and something that was very kind of personal and very, you know, close to his heart. And, you know, he would raise a lot of money for diabetes and for different charities. And he just seemed to have more of a personable character Mm. about him. Not saying that Joe wasn't, but on the other side, you had Joe who was publicly breaking the heart of Taylor Swift. Yeah, over the phone. Over the phone and which was revealed on Ellen DeGeneres. I mean, that clip went viral everywhere. He was publicly, you know, with Gigi Hadid and wasn't, I mean, she wouldn't have the same, you know, maybe public love as Taylor Swift did at the time. Um, Had been kind of going back and forth with Demi Lovato, who had a lot of followers at the time and was also in a very vulnerable position. So I just think, you know, be it right or wrong, I think the way they were both framed was very different. And the way Nick Jonas was framed was as this lovable, very approachable, very personable man who was going to be the president of America. (laughs) Versus versus Joe Jonas, who was seen as a bit of a player and a bit Mm. of a, you know, didn't have, you didn't feel like you knew as much as you knew about him. And I know that sounds a bit ridiculous. No, I, it's a hundred percent what I was going to say. Like Nick, made himself more accessible by being as open, as vulnerable as he did. And I know it is a joke, but like the diabetes thing did late. And even if you consider the fact that like, because obviously his public life was playing out publicly, even with the likes of Miley Cyrus and the Seven Things song. But even in that song, he kind of doesn't come across as badly as the likes of Joe with Taylor Mm -hmm. and the phone narrative. You know what I mean? So immediately you're like, okay. I'm on, but like, you, there's a thing where it's like, Joe is the bad boy, but he's not, it's not even like lovable bad boy because he's so inherently inaccessible and like unrelatable to, whereas like Nick kind of yeah. benefited from being as open, as honest as he and was. Exactly. And I think like, you know, obviously then, you know, like I was a huge Taylor Swift fan, so I did feel <laughs> loyalty to Taylor Swift as well. I think that definitely affected my vote if there was a vote. But I think that's followed on. Like, if you think about like their personal lives now, and I don't think we should have any right to access or anything like that. But if you think about Nick Jonas, Priyanka, the fact that they have a daughter, we know they have a daughter. We know that they got, you know, they had this huge lavish wedding. With Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner, like, we don't know, you know, about their kids. We, and I'm not saying we shouldn't know about their kids, to be honest. But I just mean that, like, their personalities are still like that. Nick mm. Jonas is much more open than Joe Jonas is. And mm. I guess, 
I do think that's a, a universal thing that people maybe latch on to, that they they think they know Nick better than they know Joe. So yeah. I definitely think that had an impact. And I think, you know, just at the time and just with the stories that were going wrong around, you know, I'd say half of them weren't real anyway, but there was just definitely more of, a, I think, a public sway towards supporting Nick than there was towards supporting Joe. Um, but yeah, timing as well. I mean, it, it's, it's all about the timing, but it is just interesting how much, you know, that kind of, vulnerability can affect your success I think people really latched on to that and and they mm. really looked back as a result it was very funny then to watch Joe kind of flop as a solo artist and then be like okay like he's still making music but doesn't maybe want to do it as a solo project so he's working with I think it was two touring members that he'd met as part of yeah. the Jonas Brothers uh Jack Lawless and Jinju Lee. And then it was one of the other people from the band Semi Precious Weapons, Cole Whittle. Mm-hmm. They all kind of started working on stuff together, which then became DNC, which the Wikipedia helpfully explains is a misspelling of the word dance. Thank you. Didn't understand Thank that. Thank you so much. <laughs> and they did, like, they did have a bona fide hit then. And this was pre, I think this is the year before last year was complicated. So this was in 2015. They have like a genuine hit with Cake by the Ocean. But it's funny if I was to kind of do a straw poll, of, if I went down onto the streets now and said, who are the members of DNC? I feel like a lot of people, do, I feel like a lot of people don't associate that band with Joe Jonas. And also, as much as Cake by the Ocean is a hit, it's also kind of nearly become a novelty hit in a way, hasn't it? No, 100%. And I think like, it's one of those ones that you play it for someone, they know the song, but they have no idea who, you know, they might not even know it's DNCA, never mind Joe Jonas. Like it mm. definitely was one of those. And it was a bit of a one hit wonder. I know they had success with Toothbrush afterwards and, you know, they had moderate success with their releases, but Cake by the Ocean was the standout success of that project. And yeah, it, it does have that kind of feel that, you know, you'd even see it in like, I don't know, in the background of TikToks, but sure, people don't actually associate it with Joe Jonas or mm. the Jonas Brothers. And it's just interesting that he found that success with another band and that he kind of like, you know, decided to shift his focus to another band and again, changed his look so much. Like, Joe Jonas feels a bit like a chameleon. Like he really does suit whatever the mood is of whoever he's singing with. You know, obviously he went through so many looks with the Jonas Brothers. I mean, again, another podcast could be the hair of the Jonas Brothers. Like they went from absolute looks like throughout the years, but Joe Jonas in particular. But, you know, again, shifted his look when he's with DNCE and really... I don't know. I don't know if I always believe that when you, sh- you know, when you really kind of adapt each time. I mean, it was cool and it was successful and he clearly had a lot of fun with it. Um, And, you know, they still play Cake by the Ocean as part of their like Jonas Brothers set now. Again, I have to say that was great when I saw them in Glasgow, Um, much like Jealous. And, you know, even the fact that Nick and Joe then sing on it, like I think it's just stronger again. So it's an interesting thought that you know, another band was his kind of next protocol. But again, just not the success of the Jonas Brothers and not the known brand that the Jonas Brothers are. Like they're never, it's never going to get to that level. Yeah. I saw DNC support Bruno Mars in Marley Park, if you can believe that, when he played here many moons ago. And they were good. But again, I was like, this is a bit weird. And it felt like everyone in the audience is like, I don't really know what's going on here. You know what I mean? Didn't they support Selena Gomez or someone? They supported someone around America as well that was kind of like, the tables have turned. Yeah. Do you know, it was just, and that must be difficult. Like, you know, obviously those years of like the split anyway must have been difficult to kind of maneuver and like to kind of understand what was going on. But just even the fact that you're kind of like starting again almost and you don't have that brand recognition. Like, obviously, I mean, they had huge success because Jonas Brothers fans followed DNC around America and you know went to all the gigs but you would be you would want to find new fans at the same time and I'm sure they did to a certain you know level but definitely not the same success so yeah of a fail (laughs) yeah do you reckon like they're obviously enjoying the success now with the Jonas Brothers at the same time it does kind of feel like a bit of a this tour that as you said it's kind of focused on like eras they had a most recent album that was just called the album. I'm wondering if it if this is like their last run in it before they kind of maybe stop again or take a break. And if that is the case, like, could you see Joe and Nick having another go at the solo career? Or do you reckon like this is it for them in terms of music? Because obviously we mentioned like Nick is acting away. 
Joe will obviously, they'll always remain famous and be doing things. But I suppose yeah. in terms of the the boy band, solo member exit music career, is this the end of that for the two of them? I think it maybe should be, but I don't think it will, will be. Like, okay. I think they're quite kind of, I don't know, they, they clearly enjoy making music and mm. they clearly are happy enough to try lots of different things. I don't know. I think something major would have to happen for them almost not to have to try it. Like, okay, obviously, you know, Nick Jonas is acting, Joe Jonas, you know, he was on The Voice Australia. Like, he's they've all done random things. I mean, not even talking about Kevin, like... Billboard success zero, but reality TV show check check check. He's, he's writing. Been, he's writing books. He's he hosts the show called Claim to Fame, which is about yes, all these famous relatives, and you're, you the, they have to figure out who the famous person is they're related he to. He also presents that with Franklin Jonas, like the young Jonas brother. How oh funny is that? He was gosh. on. He was on Real Housewives of New Jersey. I when I read this, I could not believe it because obviously with the the two lads are away singing away, and Nick's like, I still get yeah. jealous. <laughs> Kevin's like, okay, well, I need to do something else here in case this all blows up my face. So he set up this like contracting business. He he's very involved in property and stuff. Very so he involved. appears in the Real Housewives New Jersey like as a contractor. I was like, what a, what a cameo! Like really? unbelievable, unbelievable. So, so like you know, I feel okay if if it ended tomorrow. Kevin Jonas has so many business ventures that like he is an entrepreneur at this point. So like fine, yeah. he's he's fine. But Nick and Joe, I they just keep coming back like. I honestly would not be surprised if they did more solo projects, but I really don't think they would succeed because I think, you know, surely off the back of the success and, you know, if this doesn't go well, I don't know what's going to go well because Jonas Brothers seem to be so successful now. They are definitely more successful this second time around than they were before this yeah. Like, yeah. you know, you do hear them on the radio. Like, I kind of still get a wee bit of a, oh my God, that's the, that's the Jonas Brothers on the radio. It just did not happen back in the day. Whereas it really does happen now. And they are very successful commercially. They're still not, you know, selling the albums that, that other artists are selling. But they have such loyalty, such support, are selling out worldwide tours. If this isn't, you know, if this doesn't make them happy, I'm not sure where they're going to go after this. And because off the back of like their random solo projects, it's actually very difficult to know where they're going to go. So I don't think they should venture out solo again, but I honestly think they will because I just yeah. think they have something within them. Like they have been recording music, you know, since they were children, since like 2005 professionally. They have it in them to record and to release music. And I'm not sure what is going to have to happen to make them stop that. Um, I think it would be very interesting. I mean, I think a solo Joe Jonas project off the back of like a public divorce, off the back of being a father. You know, I do think there's a lot of material there. Mm. I do think it's interesting to see what they would do with that. I'm not sure any of it would be as successful as the likes of Jealous or the likes of the Jonas Brothers career. But honestly, I just I just don't think they'll stop, Vanilla. Like, they just love to release music. If Nick Jonas returned to Nick Jonas' administration, I think that would be me and my <laughs> That's what you want. That's what That's you're what I want. Uh, manifesting. I'm pretty sure, pretty sure nobody else wants that. He's going to run for president in 20... What was it? You have to be over 35, don't you? Yeah, I think He's so. He's like a year older than me, I think. So, yeah, in a few years' so time. We've a, it, we've a bit to wait, okay. We've a, we've a wee bit to, to wait. And you know what? Maybe it's not a solo album Nick will be releasing, but it's just a campaign trail for the presidency. Yeah. Oh, you never know. I mean, we can only hope. We can only <laughs> hope. We talked about the success of Sucker, but what do you make of the latter day Jonas Brothers releases? Are you a fan? Do you think they're good? I am a fan. I do right. think it's a more mature sound. Um, I do think, and like, you know, I don't know if you ever get this where like, you're like, okay, I don't feel great today. What am I going to listen to? I regularly listen to music from 2009. I don't know what, like that year, you know, I just think nostalgia always cures a gloomy day. Yeah. So I was a big fan of Lions, Vines and Trying Times. Like it to me was... Um, a brilliant album like I thought it was amazing I got it for my birthday that year I was obsessed so I would like get a lot of comfort I think from listening back to old Jonas Brothers stuff I don't do it obviously that regularly now but if I was to do it I would get great comfort from it I do think their new music is good I think it's got a much more mature sound I think they've clearly like grown into their sound but it definitely just doesn't excite me the same way the OG albums do. 
Um, yeah. And obviously, obviously that's nostalgia. Obviously that's kind of like fond memories of, you know, being a teenager and not knowing anything about what they were singing about, but, you know, feeling all the feels as I listened. Um, so I don't get the same excitement, but I do think, I do think it's good. I'm interested to see it live when they yes. take off off in September. I think that will be interesting. I think the whole kind of concept of the show will be interesting because you'll really like, you know, in the space of one night, hear the progression. So mm. I think that will even be interesting to compare. Um, but no, I think they're doing good stuff. Will they release another album? Like, who knows? I just, it's so uncertain. I just feel like they are constantly unsure themselves as to what the next step is. And clearly by the fact that they've postponed dates, you know, there's there's a lot going on in the background there. Any band dynamic is difficult. I think a family band dynamic is always going to be more difficult. Um, so who knows what's coming? But I think re- kind of listening back to old music is always what's going to give me the most kind of comfort and happiness, to be honest. <laughs> It's all fair. Maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna revisit Lines Vines and Trying Times now. But off the back of this conversation. See, it's paranoid. I don't know. And I also had the song, you know, Fly With Me. It was in, in Night at the Museum too. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I had another a banger film. A banger film. A banger. And they were cherubs in the film. Um, do you remember? Yes. Like, <laughs> oh my God. I went to the cinema to see the Jonas Brothers Terps, but that fly with me was my alarm in the morning, every morning for school. So even Perfect. now, like how many years am I out of school? Even now when I hear it, I wake up. Like yeah. something in my body just says, right, Creep, it's time for school. <laughs> um, that's a great album. It's a great album, which again, I had to listen to on YouTube for I think maybe three weeks before I finally got the album on my birthday because I wasn't allowed it before then. I'm I'm portraying my mother as a very strict mother. She wasn't. <laughs> if you're listening. <laughs> I feel like this has been a very beneficial conversation for you to maybe get some it things out. So very therapeutic. Um well yeah, look. between me, myself, uh me and myself, my mother and the Jonas Brothers. <laughs> Um, enjoy the Belfast gig. I do think I do think it'll happen. I'm I'm praying. I'm sure it'll happen. It has to everything. It has to for our own sake. Yeah, no, it has to. And like, you know, it's disappointing it's not happening in June, but to be fair, June is a mad month of concerts. So maybe yeah. wait until September is maybe not the, a bad Yeah, maybe for the best. Um, Cuiva Gormila Magos, uh, where can people find you should they want to? Um, I suppose the easiest place is Instagram. I'm now no longer Cuiva Jonas. I'm now Cuiva <laughs> Chats um, on Instagram. Uh, so everything is there, all my TV radio podcast stuff is all over on Quiva Chats on Instagram I'll link all that below Quiva thank you so much for joining me on Flap Culture much appreciate it thanks so much Vanilla Grove Mila Magos Quiva I leave all of her links below Trucker SOS is available now wherever you get podcasts how are we feeling about this new Joe Jonas music it feels very much like Course correction, it feels very much like reclaiming the narrative, you know, I mean, the whole thing of like, even baddies get saddies. Obviously, he's just out of this other relationship as well. He's just broken up with Stormy Bree. He's obviously off the back of his divorce from Sophie Turner. Here's some of the other lyrics. Come on, Joe, you got so much more to be grateful for. Stop being sad because you're making the room uncomfortable. Okay, I get it right now. You're feeling so miserable. Sometimes I wish I had powers to be invisible. Invisible. And then the caption was, even baddies get saddies. And a crying face, hashtag new music. And I, like, this is the thing with Joe, right? Joe is very, mm, depending on who you ask and what their interpretation of good is, he's very good at social media in the sense that he was like, or and maybe it's him or whatever, it's his team, that's kind of irrelevant. He gives like chronically online in the sense that like he gets all the memes, he's able to jump on top of them. He was very much on the kind of be real bandwagon before be real even opened to like celebrities and was very good at showcasing that to fans. Like is kind of a bit of a chronic poster. He's kind of like pre-Sophie and he's still trying to maintain it after their split, but like very much like I'm silly, I'm hot, but like, I'm silly. I'm just a bit of a silly guy. I'm a bit of a goofy guy. And I just, I think that's where this caption is coming from to even try and like co-opt internet language and TikTok language and stuff like that. I, is there a world that truly wants Joe Jonas solo music? Is it kind of giving, you know, like... I don't know. Is it kind of, it's kind of giving, and this, I don't mean this as a good comparison. Like it's kind of giving like Justin Timberlake, like trying to say 
something that I don't think anyone is really particularly interested in hearing. And if they're like, I don't think anyone wants it from the music. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Am I wrong? I can't believe I'm saying this as someone who genuinely did really enjoy the the first album, but it will be interesting to see where this goes, if anywhere. I kind of don't think it's going anywhere, but anyway. Finally, speaking of Justin Timberlake, top of the flops. You're a flop. Girls, if you could see me, I'm grinning ear to bloody ear. I Like, as someone who has, I would say, wide parameters for forgiveness and you know, was has a, has a huge grow for Future Sex Love Sounds, that album. The whole post Britney of it all and him initially apologising, I was like, I was willing to be a bit more lenient with Justin Timberlake than I'd say other people would be. And then this new album was coming and then he was like, actually, no, I'm not sorry. And was trying to be fucking team you, Conor McGregor being like, oh, you know, I apologise to absolutely no one. Boring, yawning, sloppy, I'm falling asleep. He does that and I'm like, okay, well then maybe you deserve absolutely everything that's coming to you. The album flopped, he's on tour. The tour kind of looks semi-interesting and seems to be doing reasonably well in the States, right? Who knows now after what has transpired over this week. He was arrested over allegations of driving while intoxicated in the Hamptons in the early hours of the morning in the wealthy village of Sag Harbour in New York. He was given a field sobriety test, but refused to conduct a breathalyzer. We have the mugshot. Apparently, Justin was trying to say he only had one mar- martini. Those eyes do not say one martini. Those eyes say one martini for Maria Rose. You know, what's that pink shot called? I can't remember. Anyway, he's drunk in the photo. Like, he's absolutely drunk in the photo. His friends were like trying to get him off, trying to talk to the police officers, being like, no, no, like it's fine, like let him go, whatever. Hello, fucking typical white rich privilege. But this is the kicker. This is, this is what gets me. This is the little, this is the, not a moose bouche Piece de resistance. This is the garnish. And what's already like a, not a good story, drink driving, flop behavior, needless to say, but just the just desserts of it all. So the cop that pulled Justin over because he saw they saw him running a red light and then he was swerving so the cop was like hmm might investigate that the cop that pulled him over was so young that he didn't even know who the singer was he didn't recognize him or his name and killer killer like how do you come back from that immediately scalped apparently Justin was like this is going to really affect the tour the cop is like what tour Justin's like the world tour oh And this is coming from someone, there's obviously an amazing lot of clips coming up now from, it was the Brits, I think. And again, it was during this, I think it was the Future Sex Love Sounds era where Justin makes this really specific plea to the camera, to a celebrity where he goes, you know who you are. And is like, um, I have it here now, sorry. He's at the Brits and there's this clip and he says, I'll drop it in here, but I'm going to read it out as well. Stop drinking. You know who you are. I'm speaking to you. Stop drinking. You're going to get sloppy. OK is going to say something bad about you. Like that man has actually been on Britney's ass since time immemorial. <sighs> flop behavior. Sorry. Floppity flop. Floppity flop 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 flop. Floppy man. I hope we never hear from him again. Truly. Anyway. That's it for me this week. Thank you so much for listening. Follow us on social media. It's at flopculture underscore pod. Just keep up to date on what's going up on the podcast. Please leave five star reviews because it helps people find the podcast. Tell a friend if you liked it and you thought they might like it too. We're on Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash flopculture. You get three bonus episodes a month. Coming up, we have a episode on chart gouging and how artists are playing the charts more than ever with variants and digital exclusive stuff like that. This is off the back of the Charlie Taylor Swift debacle. Did Taylor keep Charlie off the number one spot in the UK with Brat? It's actually not as simple as you might think. Have a really great great guest for that. Michael Craig is joining. He's a brilliant freelance journalist. I'm so excited to chat to him. And of course, we'll be taking a mid-year look at who is top of the flop. So Podrick Wilson McCarthy, if you want to get the audio only, you can subscribe in feed and Apple Podcasts as well. We're on YouTube if you want to watch some of the episodes over there. Thank you to Adam Shanahan for editing this episode. I will be back next week. Bye-bye.